Dear viewers, coming now to the next episode of our video presentation on the concise uh, biography of Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Qaid Azam. The title that we have for the next uh, portion of this episode is Success, Fame and Maturity. Almost simultaneously with the turn of the 20th century, there came about a change in the fortunes of the young and struggling barrister, Jinnah. As his reputation as a lawyer became well established and his income went on increasing from month to month, he gave up his room in the modest hotel and rented a spacious flat on Apollo Bandar. He had the flat tastefully decorated, moved into it furniture that he had helped his furniture maker to specially design for his house and equipped it with a well-stocked library. He now owned a luxurious flat which was soon to become an important center where problems connected with the public, life of Bombay were often to be discussed. Gopal Krishna Gokhale, a famous politician and social reformer, once said of the Kaid, Mr. Jinnah is one who has true stuff in him and that freedom from all sectarian prejudice which makes him the best ambassador of Hindu-Muslim unity. On his part, Jinnah said his ambition was to be the Muslim Gokhale. And here is a glimpse of Mr. Gokhale's personality through one of his famous statements. What the country needs most at the present moment is a spirit of self-sacrifice on the part of our educated young men. And they may take it from me that they cannot spend their lives in a better cause than raising the moral and intellectual level of their unhappy low castes and promoting their well-being. In his formative years, Jinnah's own political views had been shaped by Gokhale, Dada Bhai Naroji, Surendranath Banerjee and C.R. Das, all of whom he adopted as his political gurus and for whom he had the greatest of respect. They inspired him to remain clean and above board in politics, not to compromise with principles even though the odds be heavily against one, to fight fearlessly as a patriot in the cause of freedom, to help to raise the standard of living of the emaciated and famished millions of his countrymen. And to those principles, Jinnah remained faithful to the end of his life. Let us now view and review in some detail Jinnah's entry into practical politics and beginning of the hardcore political role that he had assumed for himself. In 1906, dear viewers, the Congress session was held at Calcutta. He went to attend the Calcutta session of the Congress as the personal secretary of Dada Bhai Nauroji, staying with him as the guest of the Maharaja of Dharbanga at his Chaurangi house. Other guests included Chamandlal, Stalwad, and Feroz Shah Mehta. When the Congress met at Allahabad in 1910, the Morley Minto reforms had already been announced, under which the principle of separate electorates for Muslims was accepted for the first time. At this session of the Congress, Jinnah moved the following resolution, seconded by Mazarulak and Hassan Imam, which was unanimously adopted. And the resolution read, while recognizing the necessity of providing for a fair and adequate representation in the legislative councils for the Mohammedan and other communities where they are in a minority, this Congress disapproves the regulations promulgated last year to carry out this object by means of separate electorates and in particular urges upon the government the justice and expediency of modifying the regulations framed under the Indian Councils Act of 1909. 
before another election comes on so as to remove anomalous distinctions between different sections of His Majesty's subjects in the matter of the franchise and the qualifications of the candidates and the arbitrary disqualifications and restrictions for candidates seeking elections to the councils. Mrs. Sarojini Naido, leading poetess, the Nightingale of India, and also a keen watcher of the development of events all over India, writes that Jena served as a crossbencher at this convention, which had met to consider a somewhat premature and artificial entente cordiale between the two communities still so sharply divided by a gulf of mutual dislike and distrust. The convention came to an inconclusive end. Jinnah joins the Muslim League. This was the next step in the hardcore political life that Jinnah had now adopted and was treading on it with his customary stateliness. Maulana Muhammad Ali and Sayyid Wazir Hassan, two Muslim League stalwarts, tried to get Jinnah enrolled as a member of the Muslim League. He consented on the understanding that this would not prevent him from continuing to be a member of the Congress. Mrs. Naido again writes, Jinnah's two sponsor were required to make a solemn preliminary covenant that loyalty to the Muslim League and the Muslim interest would in no way and at no time imply even a shadow of disloyalty to the larger national cause to which his life was dedicated. And at that stage of his political outlook, Jinnah was committed to the cause of achieving Hindu-Muslim unity. He came thus to occupy a unique position by which he could act as a bridge between the two most powerful national organizations. And this is reflected in the observation made by Bhupendra Nath in his presidential address on 27th December 1913 at the Karachi session of the Congress when he said he was very happy that the Muslim League had adopted self-government for India. The following year, that is 1914-1914, a small spark ignited at Sarajevo and engulfed Europe and Asia in the First World War. Maulana Muhammad Ali, realizing the delicate situation confronting Muslim India as Turkey was fighting against the Allies, pleaded with the Allied powers not to attack the holy places of Islam. An oppressive government becomes more tough when it is gripped with panic and the government swooped down upon Muslims who were of Muhammad Ali's way of thinking with the result that the two brothers, namely Muhammad Ali and Shaukat Ali, along with Maulana Zafar Ali Khan and Maulana Hasrat Mohani were arrested and interned. In 1916, the Congress and the League decided to hold their annual session simultaneously, this time the venue being Lucknow. Qaid was elected president of the League session in order to bring a fruitful culmination of the Congress League understanding. The Qaid in his presidential address in the League meeting said, I have been a staunch congressman throughout my public life and have been no lover of sectarian cries. It appears to me that the reproach of separatism sometimes leveled at Muslims is singularly inapt and wide off the mark when I see this communal organization rapidly growing into a powerful factor for the birth of United India. At that stage, Jinnah was a staunch nationalist. In the following words, the Qayyad set the seal of approval on the Congress League Concord. In its general outlook and ideals as regards the future, 
the All India Muslim League stands abreast of the Indian National Congress and is ready to participate in any patriotic efforts for the advancement of the country as a whole. With regard to our own affairs, we can depend upon nobody but ourselves. We should maintain a sustained loyalty and cooperation with each other. We should sink our personal differences and subordinate personal ambitions to the well-being of the community. The understanding arrived at Lucknow between the Congress and the Muslim League came to be known as the Lucknow Pact. And it was this pact that considerably influenced the shaping of the Montague Chelmsford reforms of 1919. During this period, between 1900 and 1916, Jinnah had not only forged ahead and emerged as a political leader of all India importance, he had also established himself as a leading luminary of the Bombay Bar. Let's see what now happens onwards. Jinnah joins the Home Rule League on 1st September 1916 in the Gokhale Hall in Madras. Mrs. Annie Basant launched officially the All India Home Rule League with a dynamic program and manifesto that made no bones about her intention that India must be immediately granted home rule or self-government. Students in their thousands, hundreds of professors, lawyers, doctors and journalists joined the Home Rule League. Jinnah joined the Home Rule League besides Congress and Muslim League. There was more to come in Jinnah's public life which would raise his stature even bigger and would take it to great heights in the times to come. Jinnah elected member Supreme Legislative Council. It was by accident that the Qayyad got elected to the Supreme Legislative Council in the autumn of 1909 when elections were being held for the first time under the Morley Mento reforms which had conceded separate electorates to Muslims. Muslims of Bombay city had one seat in the council. Jinnah was already a well-known figure in the public life of Bombay. Muslims with one voice decided that the best person to represent Bombay Muslims on the council would be the young barrister Muhammad Ali Jinnah. It was his first term as a legislator and the nation elected him time and again for the next 38 years, enabling him to add a deathless page to the annals of India's legislative history. Gokhale introduced his elementary education bill, which was opposed among other reasons on the flimsy ground that education breeds sedition among educated young men. While supporting the bill, Jinnah strongly repudiated this insinuation and he thundered, do you really think that education means sedition? I say, sir, that a frank and independent criticism of the government or the measures of the government is the duty of every member of the state. Surely, fair, true and independent criticism of the government does not constitute sedition. In 1913, he tabled the Waqf Validating Bill. But before he could move it, his term as a member of the council was over. Lord Harding, the Viceroy, nominated him for an extra term to enable him to pilot his bill which he did with great skill and tact, thus earning for himself the honor of being the first member to have succeeded in getting a private member's bill enacted into law. Waqf validating bill bears testimony that his extraordinary abilities as a counselor did not go unheeded. In the words of Mrs. Sarojini Naido, 
His admirable skill and tact in piloting through such an intricate and controversial measure, the first instance of a bill passing into legislation on the motion of a private member, won him not only the appreciation of his colleagues, but also the first meet of general recognition from Muslims all over India, who, while still regarding him a little outside the orthodox pale of Islam, were so soon to seek his advice and guidance in their political affairs. Jinnah had proved by his consistently good and devoted work as a member of the council that there were few in the country to equal him in parliamentary eloquence and political foresight. So that when the elections were once again held in 1917, he was elected to the Imperial Legislative Council from the Muslim constituency of the Bombay Legislative Council. And dear viewers, let us now move on to what lay ahead. Even more challenges were to come Mr. Jinnah's way. The tumultuous years towards achievement of Hindu-Muslim unity. The Secretary of State and the Viceroy found that Congress and League stood solidly behind the Lucknow Pact. Government machinations were not slow to detract from the importance of this joint stand, to express popular resentment against this move of the British government, a mass public meeting was held in Bombay in November 1917 with Jinnah in the chair. He fearlessly exposed the unholy conspiracy and warned the government of the disastrous consequences that would follow if the expectations of the people were not fully met. In December 1917, joint session of the League and Congress met at Calcutta. Jinnah was working wholeheartedly and tirelessly for Hindu-Muslim unity and for self-government. The resolution demanded immediate introduction of a bill embodying the reforms contained in the Congress League scheme of December 1916 with a view to establish complete responsible government within a fixed deadline, provided always that the principle of adequate and effective representation of the Muslim community is made a sine qua non in any scheme of reforms. Jinnah was justifiably referred to as ambassador of Hindu-Muslim unity, but his prime concern remained the Muslim community. I standing here, I believe I am voicing the feelings of the whole of India say that what we demand is the immediate transfer of the substantial power of government of this country and that is the principal demand of our scheme of reforms. The British were perturbed at the success of Jinnah in accomplishing the impossible, that is complete Hindu-Muslim accord in politics. This, my dear viewers, at that stage was a unique and a wonderful achievement by the undeterrable Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah. While rumors were insidiously set afloat by the British agents that incensed minds of religious fanatics and there were communal riots in a number of places, one such place being Ara in UP where Muslims for no fault whatsoever had become victims of Hindu frenzy. Jinnah remained with his lifelong dream of bringing the two communities together, though the cold logic of political accord and friendly social intermingling divorced from religious, sectional or racial antagonism and prejudices that traditionally tended to divide Hindus and Muslims. Coming to the last part of our today's presentation, we 
term it as the Cupid strikes and Jinnah gets married. Mr. Jinnah lived an upright life. Up to 40 years he had lived alone. No breath of romance had penetrated his solitary world. Jinnah was very popular with the Parsis of Bombay, an exclusive but extremely rich community. The Parsis of Bombay had an exclusive club where most of the millionaires of the community gathered every evening and membership of the club was not open to non-Parsis. Members, however, could bring non-Parsis as guests. At this club, Jinnah was a constant guest which gave him a welcome entry into the homes of most of the rich families. He often met at the club Sir Dinshaw and Lady Pettit, at whose house he was a frequent guest at dinner parties. Jinnah was not only a brilliant advocate at the bar, but also a fascinating conversationalist. The Pettits had a pretty daughter, Ratanbai Pettit, about 17 years of age. She was beyond her years and her adolescent mind eagerly followed the brilliant and witty, sometimes serious, conversation that freely flowed in her father's dining and drawing rooms. At first, her interest in Jinnah was that of a young admirer for a scintillating personality of the public platform. But the two soon developed and discovered that they had a common interest in life to which both were especially devoted. They were passionately fond of horse riding and often early mornings the two went out horse riding for miles on the chopati sands away from the noise and din of the life of a big busy city. Sir Dinshaw and Lady Pettit were going to a hill station for the summer vacation with their daughter and suggested to Jinnah that he should pass his vacation at the same resort. The Pettits and he met frequently at the summer resort and often he and Miss Pettit went out riding. Returning back to Bombay, Jinnah was absorbed in his work. Nonetheless, he continued to be an occasional guest at the house of the Pettits. Summer vacation had once again come. Jinnah went to the same hill station where the Pettits and Jinnah met almost every day. The two discovered that friendship had developed into attachment. The two decided that they would convey the news to Sir Densher and Lady Pettit to obtain their blessings for their marriage. When she informed her parents of her love, the parents were shocked beyond measure. They explained to her the consequences of a marriage of a girl of 17 and a man of 41. So he waited for a year for Ruti to become 18 years old, the legal age of adulthood. Her parents thought it best to reconcile themselves to the inevitable. And on 19th April 1918, the statesman announced Miss Ratanbai, only daughter of Sir Dinsha Pettit, yesterday underwent conversion to Islam and is today to be married to the Honorable Mr. Ame Jinnah. My dear viewers, I'm sure that you enjoyed our presentation that we just made to you. And we hope that you will keep watching our episodes to follow with keen interest. We can assure you that we are doing our best to bring you the very best. Thank you very much.